when this started, it was thrown out the window and it's never come back in the window. Uh, they will spend three million, five million per per life's year saved. God knows. And the irony is that if the lockdowns are not doing a whole lot extra over distancing, which all the mathematics say they're not really, then you're spending near infinite numbers per life saved if you're not even really saving lives. I'm just worried about this completely crazy panicked world. Um, if you, uh, I, I'll send you a link to my Medium post, which is the one thing I actually posted publicly. And the last three white words are, can you, do you know somebody who knows somebody who can stop this madness now? And this is the 22nd of March. Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Huge honor today on the Fat Emperor podcast. We have our first and possibly only Nobel Prize winner. Uh, on the show today and it's Professor Michael Levitt of Stanford and he works there out of the medical school and he got the 2013 Nobel Prize for Chemistry awarded for complex chemical reaction modeling uh, and progression and as you can imagine this kind of exceptional expertise is going to be very useful in analyzing the numbers on our current issue so Michael, uh, Professor, huge honor. Uh, delighted to have you here. Thank you very much, Ivan. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I like your style. <laughs> well, I do what I can. But, uh, you know, just on your credentials there, I gave a very, very high-level view, but maybe just a little short summary of, of general history and credentials before we get into this, because it's such a controversial topic. I love to have real experts in math, and you know biochemistry and because that this is all about the numbers really now beyond the actual biology so basically i have lived about a quarter of my life in four different countries south africa britain israel and the united states i was born in south africa came to england to study worked in israel at the beginning and now i'm working in stanford but it was all much more balanced lots of backwards and forwarding um, i studied physics uh, at king's college in london went on to do a PhD at uh, the Cambridge Laboratory of Molecular Biology, which uh, was a remarkable place. This is where Francis Crick uh, did the work on DNA and so on. So uh, it was a remarkable place. Um, I was always just about the only non-experimentalist you know, at any institution I've worked at, because uh, I'm always surrounded by experimental biologists. And my approach was to basically use computers, which were just coming into being. I mean, I've been doing this now for 53 years or something like that. It's a long time since I was 20. So, uh, you know, I, I, but I was always like the person who tried to make things more quantitative and uh, it involved modeling, it involved data analysis, it involved often logic, you know, just if this is like this and this is not like this, then sanity checks. The whole thing is full of sanity checks because one realizes that you're dealing with very large sets of numbers and you're always looking out for, for the bug, for the error. So you get quite good at you know, proposing things and then just seeing if they're really true. This is something that experimental biologists do really, really well. Um, I've been at Stanford for 30 something years um, and I still move around a lot. Yeah, so you're such a diversity of experience. And it's funny when you describe there everything you said and including looking at logic and distinctions and analyzing data properly and not being biased, it's all absolutely the engineering problem solving method which i've been doing for nearly 30 years uh, it's always going to be the same things that get you to the truth and bypass belief systems or anti-science as i like to call it so you know we might start off with rather than getting into your journey from january when most people didn't know what was coming you were analyzing the china data you immediately got the bug but and we get into that but first maybe a high level view an executive summary of what is the real data and mathematical and scientific proof around lockdown efficacy versus distancing efficacy versus the normal kind of curve that viruses follow rise and fall maybe a high level view so basically because of my experience with china which was somewhat accidental but that's not important uh, i sort of got the feeling that this virus was much much less powerful than I might have thought. It wasn't growing exponentially. It was relatively easy to control. Um, the real death rates were, were very variable and not that terrible. 
And this is all basically by the end of February, um, by which time things started to spread. So my, my, my view, and this hasn't really changed, the, the, there are things about the data that suggest that uh, this is a virus with its brakes on. Uh, certainly when you look at it compared to some of the exponential growth scenarios. Uh, and we can go into that in more detail, but uh, this puzzled me. But as things have proceeded, um, I've realized more and more and more why the brakes are on and what's really going on. And uh, I guess this is going to sound strange, but in some ways I feel almost embarrassed that things I said two months ago are actually still true. Because in a field moving at this rate, this shouldn't be the case. I should also say that uh, I'm, the, I'm probably the least political person you can imagine. I'm also somebody who doesn't take sides. If I watch a tennis match or a football game, I actually like both sides to win. And I really don't care. And I, I like the moves. So I'm not a, although I've been in many different countries, I'm not a very, I'm a very global person. I sort of care very much about people. But I don't really care whether they're my people or somebody else's people or whatever. You know, we're all people living on the earth. And I think this also gives me a, a little bit of a different perspective of how this is. But the high level view was that there were many signs uh, that were really available by the middle of February, but let's say by the end of February, to indicate that this is a virus that has weak legs. Yep. So in terms of like distancing will slow it somewhat, a lockdowns added to distancing may be very questionable. What would your feelings be versus free spread, which happened in Europe, to be quite honest, up until March, no one did anything. And it's a high R virus. So it was obviously all over the place. So at that point, when you distance, you can slow it somewhat. Um, and then lockdowns, which cause enormous collateral damage, possibly add very little extra. So what's your uh, thoughts on that now? But I, would, I, would, I would agree with that in general. I, 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 instead of saying distancing versus lockdown, I sort of try to say smart distancing I mean, lockdown is a form of distancing, uh, but it's a very extreme form. I've called it medieval distancing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the, I think there's no doubt if you, you know, if, if you had a country and you started out before there was any corona there, locking people, you know, not letting people ever talk to other people, the country would not get even a single case of coronavirus. So in that sense, you know, if nobody meets anybody and you don't catch it over the internet, you're fine, except that are you really fine? And, uh, you know, there is an issue here about an epidemiologists certainly used to maintain that there should be no shutdowns, there should be no stopping of global transportation. Things should be allowed to sort of reach the equilibrium in whatever way. Now, the key thing here is, is controlling, you know, overloading uh, ICUs and things like that. And that, I think, requires a careful control. But I remember very early on saying that one should firstly monitor very carefully. And one thing I did discover from the work in China is that just looking at number of cases today divided by yesterday is a very, very good indication of how the virus is growing. So you could almost imagine that if you were a benevolent leader, you would decide that you want to try to cause as little damage, but also realize from the numbers that this virus is not going to kill you know, much more than flu is going to kill. I'm not saying it's a small number. Flu is a, is a bad disease, but it's a disease which we have to put up with because flu mutates and people still don't even take vaccines. So you could almost argue that flu is like the threshold of acceptable risk. We, at least in terms of experience, countries never have shut down, at least since the last hundred years, for flu. And there's been a lot of flu around. So I think that uh, a smart thing to do would be and this, I said, it sounds rather cruel, but basically adjust social distancing in a very dynamic way to keep the ICUs full, but never overflowing. Don't lock down locally. I think local lockdown, like schools and locally, but you might, for example, let's say in Ireland, which I looked at a little bit, let's just imagine that Dublin is really you know, full on, but there's nothing yet in Cork. So you may want to not let people travel freely between Dublin and Cork. And so you might want to restrict interurban travel, or for example, if there is a train, you know, take their temperatures, make them wear masks, and things like this. So I think there are, there are ways of distancing which are really much less intrusive than locking people down, taking away their livelihood, putting kids out of school so parents are now 
in, in difficult social situations. Um, but I think that uh, this is a virus that seems to be, uh, it, it hits very, very early. I think the, the ability to lock down almost depends on locking down before you have a single case. And the reason is, is that there are many, many hidden cases. So that by the time you see one case, it's a bit like mushrooms coming out of the ground, by the time you see one coming out of the ground, you can be pretty sure that the whole area is full of mushrooms about to come out of the ground. Not only that, but many of the infected people are asymptomatic. So they never actually feel sick. And therefore, let's imagine you were to say we have a very responsible population. Anybody who is sick you know, stays at home or whatever. Now, but if you know, 50% or even more than that of the infected people never feel sick, and they feel great, then they're going to be very active. So in some ways, I think part of the secret of this being controlled, and this really comes from places like Japan or Taiwan, uh, China, outside of Hubei, is wearing masks is a really effective way of doing social distancing. In some ways, if, if you speak to somebody through a mask, you are, you've, you're a long way away from them in terms of how much your saliva droplets can get to them. And this is, and this is a completely natural thing when anyone in China has a cold. So, simply insisting that everyone wears a mask from the very first this was seen was completely natural in China, Korea, maybe less so in Korea, but certainly in Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong. And all of these places uh, seem to have controlled their outbreaks with relatively small numbers of infection. At the other side of the game, we have places like Lombardy, Northern Italy, England, United Kingdom, France, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, New York and uh, parts of Illinois, where there's almost been, I would say, like complete burnout. And now you could sort of say, well, how bad did that get? And in Europe, you know, the complete burnout ended up being something that maybe hasn't finished yet, but let's just say right now it's about uh, three quarters of a person per 10,000. The natural mortality in all of Europe is 10 in 10,000, about 1%. So we're not talking about one fifteenth or one thirteenth of natural mortality. So it looks like the total excess death from COVID in Europe has been about one month of regular death. Um, the trouble really is, is that the uh, population profiles in Europe are very different from those in, in, in uh, certainly in China, very different from those in the USA. So you can't use exactly the same rule everywhere. But that is a, a you know, and it, it always surprised me was, you know, why did Northern Italy actually stop? I mean, you know, they hadn't killed everybody. In fact, the death rate was not that different from flu. And I'm, again, I'm not using flu as an example, except that in Northern Italy, it's a very flu prevalent area. In fact, in spite of the fact that it's so flu, flu, that there's so much flu there, people don't take vaccines. Uh, again, for reasons that I, I'm not going to get it. You know, I don't understand this, but it's obviously not considered. But, it, you know, having 20,000 people die in a severe flu in North Italy is not unusual. It doesn't happen every year. Um, so, you know, I, 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 my wife was just telling me, you know, you keep on comparing COVID to flu. And I say it has the same numbers. It's not the same disease. And the big differential for me is medical professionals. Medical professionals understand the flu. They all take their vaccines and hardly any of them are gonna catch flu from a sick patient, whereas in Corona, we don't have that. So the medical people have been the heroes in that they've had to take, on the one hand, an incredibly panicked population, pressure from the government, a desire somehow to maximize the number of COVID cases and still treat people. Um, but, you know, they coped. I mean, even in, even in the United Kingdom, I mean, people have said that the NHS has come up the heroes of this thing because they managed to cope. It was all predicted that they were gonna collapse and fall. And again, Britain's numbers, whether they're the numbers they've reported or the numbers that places like the Financial Times think they are, are all within this realm of about one month of natural death. So it does seem that, you know, and now you could always argue, and people have been arguing, that any, cease, any cessation of the epidemic is not due to burnout, it's due to the measures you've put into place. But a lot of evidence is, is mounting to suggest that isn't the case. Um, you know, I, I initially bought the fact that in China, that could have been the case. 
um, not inside Hubei, but outside Hubei. And for my analysis, I, des I defined a, a new region of China called China non-Hubei, which is a very it's a huge country with, uh, you know, 1.4 billion minus 50 million people. But that, the, the outbreak in that region was extremely well controlled. It was in all the different provinces, had people who had left Hubei. The, the government announced that they were going to shut down and didn't just shut down. As a result, it's reported that 5 million people left Wuhan and Hubei to go back home for the New Year holidays. And that's a large number. And controlling them all, you know, you might think that the Chinese could control them all by locking them all down. I don't believe that. I just think that they wore masks. And from those five men who left, there ended up being something like 12,000 cases and 120 deaths. Uh, and the, the curves of growth are, looked like they were manufactured. Now, I say this very carefully because I don't believe they were, although a lot of people say that you can't believe the data from China. I am totally agnostic about what I should believe or not. I look at the data, I compare it with South Korea, I compare it with New Zealand, um, I look at the death rates, and it all fits together. So, you know, if China fiddled their data, they must have a time machine because it looks just like the New Zealand data, both in yeah. magnitude and the numbers. Um, so I think, you know, right now, all the numbers seem to me to be about the same. It's interesting. Um, I guess, I, I, as I said, I'm very global in my viewpoint. For me, the hardest numbers to get hold of were initially when uh, COVID started in New York City, and they weren't posting accumulative death numbers. It went onto the screen and then it disappeared. So I used a Wayback Machine uh, to try to get earlier web pages, and then I decided, let's see how good Twitter is. My first tweet, tweet other than complaining, was to ask people if they can get me the New York death numbers, and I, copied, I, I wrote it to, as a, a tweet address, Mayor NYC. And to my amazement, I got about 40 emails back, all from people saying, here's some of the data, here's some of the data. And very quickly, I had the complete data set of New York deaths. A week later, they released it all. Um, so, you know, we, but I think the data is all very consistent. And, uh, yeah, so the data is all very consistent, concordant, uh, as I was viewing this in March as well, that the curves were following their thing and we can argue about the virology and what the curve exactly should look like but with all the different countries different policies the curve followed broadly the same kind of progression and and subsidence uh, and new york i mean just while we're on that topic new york gets brought up as an example of how bad this is but new york is far north latitude it's post winter where you're going to have pretty profound vitamin d deficiency you know, immune system kind of not in great shape. You've got a lot of minorities. They also ran their subways, packed cars right through the March period when it was super spreading. And you get high viral load from that. So New York is a corner case, very tragic one, but it fits exactly with everything else that you're looking at. You know, people use it as an example that, oh, it is much, much worse than anything else we've seen. But no, it, it just kind of fits in with everything else we've seen. Especially when you look, you know, New York City is actually five different boroughs and you can get the data for each one separately. And if you compare, say, the Bronx to Manhattan, which is actually called New York, but the borough of New York is actually Manhattan and the Bronx is, and the actual death rate per population is more than twice as high in the Bronx as it is in Manhattan. Um, you know, subway is a great spread. I think the same thing happened in London. Um, remember also, it's probably spreading before you even know there's a single case. Yeah. And this is something which makes it very, very hard to control unless you decide, you know, must go on. I mean, you can't say we, we lock down, you can't shut the subways. But if you just simply said, you know, if you're going to cough, cough into your, into your elbow, or don't talk facing somebody, um, or have all shopkeepers wear masks so when they tell you, you know, what it's costing, they're not giving you coronavirus. That would probably have worked. Um, but I agree, in New York it's about, I was telling you about what the death rate was, it's, it's normally around one in a thousand, the saturation death rate. I'm not going to call it herd immunity because that is, it's a loaded term. But when it burns itself out, 
It's typically in Europe less than one in a thousand. Uh, in Wuhan, it was about one in a thousand. And in New York, it's about one and a half in a thousand. So it's not, it, as you said, it's in that realm. What is different about New York, and this time was actually, meant, if I wasn't talking to you, I'd be actually doing this right now. Um, I found the um, age profile of the people who have succumbed very, very revealing. And what you find is, is that uh, in Europe, only 18%, only 8%, one twelfth, are younger than 65. Whereas in New York, it looked like it was at least 30%. And that's a big, big difference. It's like saying there's three times more young people. If we say less than 65 is young, which for me it is actually, but that's okay. Um, you know, three times, even more than that. I think the number was actually 35. So 35 is more than four times eight. Now, when I was thinking this, and I really wanted to do this, and I've got the data, uh, could it be, so I found that in Europe, when I just released to Twitter, and I've now put it out into a PDF file, that the death profile, the number of people at each age range, for flu and COVID in exactly the same population is very, very similar. In both cases, 8% less than 65, 50% more than 85, and then the rest is all in between. I've got a feeling that the flu profile in the United States is different from the flu profile in Europe. And that New York has a death profile that is much more like the US flu profile. Um, and I never realized this, and I'm not sure it's true, but it's, I mean, it's something where I've got all the numbers, I need two hours with Excel and I've got the answer. I'll maybe tweet it tonight or else tomorrow morning. Um, but I do know that in the USA- Excellent. You know, it looked, it, I remember reading somewhere that 25% uh, are less than 65. Um, whereas in Europe, it's 8%. So that's, I mean, 25% versus 8% is a factor of three difference. It's a big difference. Uh, and we need to look at this. Uh, and then I was, again, chatting to my wife. This is how I get all my ideas. And I was thinking it would be wonderful if somebody had a world flu map. Because let's just imagine that there's a correlation between the amount of flu deaths in a certain locality and the corona deaths. I mean, like you said, New York is very northerly and so on. But, you know, if you look at Italy, northern Italy was badly hit, southern Italy much less so. And I'm sure that this data exists, that somebody must have, you know, it, it doesn't matter. I, I think I've got the data from the U.S. states. And it would be very easy to ask, is the peak in wintertime does that peak in different states correlate to the peak now from Corona? Because that would be very, very interesting. Yeah, for sure, Michael. And, and I think in a general sense, it very likely will. And if you look at the Euro Momo, you know, mortality data, I know you've analyzed, you tend to see that in Italy, Northern Italy has a history of problematic flu death. Northern Italy has a published history of profound vitamin D deficiency and other issues, metabolic issues. So, you know, there's lots of factors here. And I think if you had a model with the 10 biggest factors, you get a pretty damn good fit. But interestingly, no one's really looking at any of these factors because the whole focus is on the medieval magics of lockdown. I mean, that's, that's what they're focused on. But I think, again, what shocked me about that is that, so firstly, I, you know, there, there are lots of examples uh, of the World Health Organization and epidemiologists uh, for them, success is minimizing the number of deaths from a particular outbreak. It's not at what cost. In other words, you know, and, and this is why you often get these very large exaggerations. And then they say, well, gee, it's because of my exaggeration that we survived this. And that's something which is very, very hard to disprove, except by looking at lots of different locations. Um, and, and my feeling is, is that it's, it's, Certainly as a scientist, and I imagine you as an engineer, being 10% wrong on the too small side is exactly the same as being 10% too wrong on the large side. Whereas it seems that when it comes to frightening people, you can be a factor of 100 wrong on the large side, but just don't be 5% wrong on the low side. And it's not a good idea. I mean, it's something which governments, uh, for whatever reason, governments panicked here. And, and uh, the, the people followed. Um, 
I, I must say, I don't really understand why it happened because, um, you know, the, the, the Western countries had a, at least a six week lead time. They, and the information, you know, it wasn't just China. They knew about South Korea. The Diamond Princess was a classic example, almost, a, almost an experiment gone wrong. And that data was all available totally by the end of February. Um, you know, and, and analyzing this data, I think anybody who can use Excel, and there are a lot of people who can use Excel, can do this. It doesn't require, you know, C++ coding or Python coding. I mean, I do all that stuff. But I actually, you know, Excel is great because what you see is what you get. And, you know, you play with the numbers until it makes sense. Yeah, as Professor Feynman, a good friend of mine, says, the best statistical test is the eyeball test. And if you chart things in Excel, you can very quickly make an instinctive judgment, particularly if you're very experienced in these things. But when you look then at the overall death, and you, you did touch on figures uh, already, but the Euro Momo, looking at the whole of Europe, I found that people were astonished that the total deaths corona so far, which may be overcounted, in 2020 are roughly the same as the 2018 winter season when you tot them all up, the excess deaths. And it would appear to be almost obvious, though I'd be careful saying that, that this flu season in 2020 was extremely soft. And through November, December, January, February, March, there was an incredible lack of flu deaths, which is quite extraordinary. And then when Corona came along, and it's a super spreader, and it is very severe, you get a huge spike March, April. But the reality is that around Europe now, and I can show afterwards in the edit of this, the graphs or anything else you mentioned, I'd be able to edit them in. Basically, Corona is coming down hard uh, in Europe. Death rates are coming right down. And the total is only approximately matching 2018 season where we we made no commentary and, and did nothing. I mean, is that, is that still the way the data yes. is looking in the last? The data, to be precise, and my, the, the data is valid up to, um, I guess, last Wednesday. They, they release the data every, every Wednesday. But I really spent almost two full days on this, basically, Friday and Saturday. And the excess deaths uh, from Corona are actually 15% more than the flu season of 15 of, of 17, 18. It turns out it's actually quite hard to get this number because Euromama uses a calendar year which doesn't actually bridge the flu season and they don't give the data for 17. So you actually have to work through the, the plots by hand and read things off by mouse overs. And they even have an error where what they give us the baseline is actually 2,000 above the baseline. So if you aren't careful, you get numbers that are 2,000 a week less than they should be without paying attention to it. So, uh, you know, I think that this is absolutely the case. I, I'd also noticed the, the lack of flu in this year. And, you know, I, it, it's horrible to make analogies, but I was kind of thinking, well, like with forest fires, when, you know, there hasn't been a forest fire for a long time, the first one's a big one. Um, the other thing, you know, is that to my surprise in my analysis, if you looked at the uh, declared reported numbers from all the countries in Euromomo and added them up, you've got exactly the same numbers as your Ramona had. So, you know, and, and I'm not sure this is just a cancellation of errors. Um, and, you know, I was, I was surprised by how well they tracked each other. So it looks to me completely consistent. I even looked at Financial Times that was trying to raise a scare tactic. Our UK was 50,000 when they only reported 30,000, but they fitted exactly. They, they, their total from the Financial Times for the Euromama countries was exactly I think it was 4% more. I mean, tiny errors. So I think it's all very, very consistent. And again, and we've talked about it a little bit, what surprised me was that Euromoma was also now releasing just for the last two weeks, the age profiles of, they have, and they have you know, below 65, 65, 75, and so on, up to a greater than 85. And this information was amazing because you could get the same profiles from flu and from Corona from exactly the same source, exactly the same countries, from the same database. And these two profiles were essentially indistinguishable. So this again is saying that, you know, it, 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 it seems to me that in any country you get a certain number of people who very sadly are less robust, more frail than other people.
and something like this comes along and they get uh, taken out. Uh, it's interesting, we were talking about lockdown. What is interesting is that no country succeeded in protecting the elderly and no country succeeded in protecting the nursing homes. And uh, even in Israel, where they made a fuss about every single death, 25% um, of the deaths were in two nursing homes. Um, so it's, it's a hard thing to do. And I think the reason they, they can't do it, I, I'm not, no, I shouldn't give a reason. It, di it didn't happen. No way. Not in New York and not in England. And, you know. Absolutely, Michael. And in Ireland as well, we have somewhere north of 60% of all deaths are care homes and institutions. Uh, in Sweden, I believe approximately 75%. Uh, Anders Tegnell, uh, the other day in a news broadcast, said 50% in care homes and another 25% in people in a home care setting. So we're talking enormous uh, percentages are related to care homes. And like you say, no one succeeded. And I think, you know, it's hard to say it, but we have to be scientific about this. The reality is, yes, if you have a soft flu season, there are only so many susceptible people, really. And if those people don't experience excess death, then they are obviously in the firing line, a terrible phrase, when a severe flu or severe coronavirus comes along. And, and I like your forest fire analogy. And that looks exactly what happened uh, in this one that all the susceptible people that normally would be hit by the generic flu, like in 2018, over a longer period, uh, were hit by a virus that came late in the day and swept through rapidly. But, but if people, can people maybe internalize two facts that are so important that right now we're around 15% worse for excess death 15% over 2018 winter season. And the way the curves are heading, and we can't predict the future, but I mean, the way the curves are heading, it might taper off in the summer with Corona in real life data being maybe 50 or 60% worse than 2018 season. And if people just internalize. I think my th the numbers in Europe are dropping very quickly. And what you're also gonna find is that I mean, in, in a very strange way, lockdown does save lives. It doesn't save the lives of the corona ill. It could save, I mean, by not having traffic accidents, not having work accidents, not having sports injuries. Um, one thing that amazed me, and again, Israel is a small country, their excess burden of death is negative 500. Whoa, yeah. And this is actually shown in the Financial Times very small, they didn't, I mean, you know, they only emphasized those that were over. Um, so, you know, but again, you know, so basically if we want to shut down economies and save lives, we can. Um, but that kind of shouldn't be what we're optimizing. Um, you know, I'm going to pick up on Israel there because, and again, for the listeners, you know, you're saying what you're saying from the data the actual data. Professor Carl Hennigan is saying the same thing from the data in the UK, that the peak of infections and deaths clearly can't have been impacted really by the lockdown. And we have Professor Ben Israel from Israel who did that mathematical analysis a few weeks ago for European data and said the same thing, the lockdown's not really shifting the curve. And the Woods Hole Institute. So just so people know, there's a whole load of professors who have done the analysis who say the same thing. Doesn't mean it's perfectly correct but the interesting thing michael is the pro lockdown people who are using basically associational data which is the lowest form of science i've been looking for carefully to find a pro lockdown person justifying that there is a great benefit and it hit the curve who has actually analyzed the actual data and said look my analysis says here's the lockdown but all I see in any analysis of this, real analysis of data, is the other answer. Lockdown didn't really change much over distancing. So why are they not doing the analysis to support their view? Um, you know, I, that's a question that I, I really can't answer. I, I, I have been surprised. Many, many of my scientific colleagues are almost hysteri hysterically pro-lockdown. So, you know, so I'm somebody who says I love Twitter. People are so nice on Twitter. And that's because I'm used to my colleagues. People are very nice on Twitter. But I'm just saying that 
I felt that there was a feeling that people were basically thinking about this like flu, but like 1918 flu. And they thought there were going to be 5 million deaths or 20 million deaths or something like this. They felt that lockdown was essential. Now, what I felt uh, and to be hypocritical about this attitude was that most of these academics are actually receiving salaries. Uh, they're not working, they don't, they don't have a store, they're not they're not cleaner, they're not driving a bus. They aren't impacted about the, so, about the economic issues. And I think they also feel that they, they know themselves. You know, I know how to lock myself down. Scientists love nothing more than staying at home working. But what about all the other people who are out there, you know, having fun and going to football games and going to the beach? And I think that, uh, you know, this is a very hypocritical attitude. I, I, I feel that the whole problem here in, in this whole issue was to think about one aspect, trying to stop the virus, instead of trying to save everybody in the, in the best possible way. And, and, you know, if someone had said, okay, let's just kill all the people above 65, we'll get rid of all any, any further deaths. Well, you know, that would be horrendous. But it was almost like they were optimizing the wrong thing. The, optimum, the thing you should be optimizing in an engineering sense is what is the best thing for my country? Yeah, and this, this is what's killing me the past two months because my whole career, I've always had to optimize both sides of the ledger, you know, customer quality versus cost of production, da, da, da. And I know this is human life, but it makes it even more important. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Paul Saladino, in an interview the other day, he said, you know, there's, and this is UK figures, I think, there's five times fewer cancer diagnoses made in the last six weeks. So a lot of people are going to suffer. There's heart attacks in Canada have gone up from people who didn't go to the hospital and the hospitals are half empty and I could go on and on. Yeah, you're going to save a few car crashes, but there's going to be a whole load of collateral debt, suffering, you know, psychological problems, excessive drinking um, all across society. This huge negative side of the ledger. And his point was that's all invisible blood because no politician or academic will ever be linked to that. It's invisible, it doesn't matter, and it can be blamed on a small piece of RNA. But right now, front and center, if I'm seen to apparently save lives, not necessarily, but apparently, my ratings are shooting up, and everyone loves it for some reason. Except that uh, when the economies of the world go south, uh, yeah. and, you know, I, I mean, again, what also gets me is that in some ways the people who are... Uh, worrying about themselves in this sort of baby boomer age group, I'm 73 and I'm a really true baby boomer, um, are very selfish because, you know, at the age of 73, whether you go out and work or not, doesn't make too much difference. Investments have actually done surprisingly well uh, through all this turmoil. And in some ways, you know, you're basically in, not deliberately asking people, but you're sort of expecting younger people to give up a lot of their future so you can get two more, two more months of life or something like that. I mean, you know, the, the analysis you can basically, and I, I wrote this in, a, in an LA Times interview that I did at the end of March, well, second, 22nd of March, I think, that basically the risk uh, having COVID is basically like doubling the natural rate of death for one month. So it's almost like the angel of death has decided to come a month early, you know, we'll take this whole group quickly and you know life is risky and when you get old it's more risky and when you're 85 the chance of dying in every month is probably one and a half percent and at my age it's half a percent you know I actually see this as a liberating thing because I can get a motorcycle now and it'll add very little to my natural rate of death or, or do sky jumping and I mean this seriously I mean you know I, I'm not my work will kill me if I do it and then I won't have, even have a chance to do it um, but I, I think that you know one lives with life. It's like saying to somebody, okay, you've got, you've got a risk for the next month. You have a choice now. You can go through it or you can kill yourself now. I mean, this, this, those are the two alternatives. And I don't think there's a lot of risk for me living for another month. Same thing is true for you. At any age, the risk of corona is about the chance of the risk of living for another month. Nobody even thinks about the risk of living for another month. Um, no. So I think it's the, you know, but we, what the media did here, and this is another thing I don't understand, there was this glorified, you know, and, and, and the old people, I have a mother who's 105 who's locked down in London. So I'm not, you know, adverse to this, I'm 73. But I do think 
that whether you like it or not, the future belongs to the young. And, you know, there is a question of, you know, somebody dying at the age of 73, my age, I've had a great life. I've done all these cool things. If somebody said to me, okay, you know, you have, I have a 16 year old grandson, you know, do you want to live forever? I'd say, no way. I want him to have his life. You know, that's, that's, that's the way nature works. Now, we always thought this way. Um, but in Israel, at one point, I try to say that what really mattered was not the number of dead, but the years of life lost, which is a very common economic measure. And people would not have it. They were saying, no, 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 every life is the same. And I said, but if a 20-year-old gets killed as a soldier, sure, that's worse than a 95-year-old, you know, with many conditions dying. And no, 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 it's the same. And, you know, that doesn't work. I mean, you know, no one will give me life insurance right now. So the insurance companies have no, no problem telling me, look, you're too big a risk to insure your life. So why, can't the, why couldn't the governments tell people the truth here? It's a major issue. And yeah, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick in the UK brought this up months ago. And it was clear even then that this was heading into a complete debacle. But uh, there's qualities, quality adjusted life I know, years. I know, which is yeah. even worse. Yeah, and it, you base medication costs. So the health system for decades has been judging whether to pay for a medication or a treatment. And they might have a guideline of, say, I don't know, 30,000 sterling per year's life saved, quality life. And they're doing that calculation all the time. When this started, it was thrown out the window and it's never come back in the window. Uh, they will spend three million, five million per, per life's year saved. God knows. And the irony is that if the lockdowns are not doing a whole lot extra over distancing, which all the mathematics say they're not really, then you're spending near infinite numbers per life saved if you're not even really saving lives. Now, the logic of lockdown, and I, I, I might curl back to this a little again without going into the deeper stats, but the lockdown, if you do it and it has a significant impact, kind of by definition, if you do a lockdown and you've got a few thousand cases in your society, and let's say it does slow the curve, well, when you pull back from the lockdown, the curve's going to bounce back up again. We're not seeing that. Slovenia, uh, Czech Republic had a constitutional challenge in the courts in mid-April, and the courts threw out the lockdown. Now, they kept some distancing, but they had a hard lockdown that in mid-April failed. And I've been told good authority in past weeks from people in, in Czech Republic, the tubes are full. Everyone, one guy said there's 60 of us here having pints outside a bar. He said it's it's gone. Now, I know some people are still doing distancing, but, you know, they're eyewitness reports. Uh, the curve hasn't changed since that all shifted, since the lockdown came off. Slovenia is the same. The curve keeps on going down. You know, Sweden have similar curves to the middle of the pack in Europe, maybe a little flatter and falling less in death. But their ICU curve began to fall on the 5th of April. And it keeps falling right down. So the debts are going to follow, lowering. So every time you look at the logic, if you take away the lockdown, what should happen if the lockdown was true is you should start getting cases rise, rising again. You have not eradicated the virus. That's absurd. You still have loads of cases. But it doesn't. So what do, you, what do you think of that one? One obvious thing is obviously an element of herd immunity. I know it's a dirty word, but the reality is what's changed now if you've got a thousand cases in your society and you pull back the lockdown and you had a thousand when you put it in, but now the curve keeps just gently floating downwards. What is that? It's not lockdown. Yeah, you know, and I agree with you about this phenomenon. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it, it may be that what happens early, and I, 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 again, you know, there's several explanations that the virus has changed, whatever, but I don't want to go that direction. It opens up too many crazy possibilities. I think there's definitely an element of, of immunity. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of this was based on some very, very weak numbers. The fact that 80% would be herd immunity. Um, I took a very different approach to this. I simply said, there's this cruise ship called the Diamond Princess. It has a population density of a quarter of a million people per square kilometer because it's a hotel. Uh, it may have wonderful lockdown facilities, but all the air conditioning is shared. There aren't individual air conditioners per room. People were eating in the same dining room. 
so let's just say it was medium, you know, it wasn't, and yet the infection rate never got, got about 25%. Maybe I think it was 20%, but, and they kept on measuring people, but I think if you measured more, you could have found more. I mean, it was the early days of uh, the measurements of tests. But basically, the, the number of deaths ended up being seven. Now, people have died subsequently, but again, for an elderly population, are we going to count all the future deaths as being because of coronavirus? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it doesn't make sense. But that actually gave a population fatality ratio of around one in a thousand almost exactly what we're seeing now. Um, so I think that there is something, but for these other cases, you know, it, it may have to do with population density. Um, I don't know enough about the topography of the, of the area. I mean, it's interesting if you compare Switzerland with Austria. Switzerland had, I think, 2,000 deaths and Austria had just a few hundred. Um, Austria did lock down very early. Um, I, I, I don't really know. It may be to do with tighter. I, I, I was very puzzled from the very beginning. Uh, in, in China, um, right from the beginning, uh, the way I got into this is that I have friends in China, and, but most of my friends aren't living in, in Wuhan or Hubei. And immediately this happened, they thought it was like SARS. And I looked at SARS, and SARS is basically 10% death rate across the board. But when you looked at the data, and the Chinese actually segmented their data almost by city early on. And what I found is, is that if you took all the cities in the province of Hubei and added them up and then subtracted them from the rest of China, the rest of China was actually behaving in a very, very controlled way. And the death rate out of Hubei was 15 times lower than the death rate in Hubei. So how, how is that? Now, it turns out that we've now had many, many death rates. We realized that it was probably because they weren't measuring enough cases. But it showed that if you, you know, didn't panic, the death rate was sort of in the range you know, of, of influenza. In fact, Anthony Fauci has a paper that he published in, he went into New England General of Medicine on the 20th of February, where he said that, you know, coronavirus looks a lot like flu. Um, I'm not sure if he would say that now, um, but the numbers seem to suggest that it even looks more like flu than you might have imagined. Um, you know, there's a whole political aspect here um, but I, I, I think that this, I see this as an experimental way. I, I mean, I definitely feel that hard lockdown is not a good idea. Uh, I don't know, and again, I don't know enough about the, what, what, what the I've not lived in Slovenia or, or the Czech Republic enough to feel, you know, exactly what the dynamic of the populations is. Um, but I, I, I sort of feel that it, it looks to me like this is gone. Uh, whether it's going to come back in, 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 in the fall. It's also become now much warmer weather. I think that's another thing to remember, that uh, uh, in Israel right now it's 38 degrees. That's very hot. I mean, you know, people, are, people are dying in the street, not viruses. Um, and maybe in Slovenia, I think that Iran was very badly hit, but Iran was badly hit in the winter. And the winters in Iran are quite cold. The skiing... They're skiing above Tehran. So, you know, it, it's not deep Middle, middle Eastern, it's quite northerly Middle Eastern. So I, I'm quite happy to believe that it's not gonna bounce back. I think also, it's very easy to monitor it bouncing back. I mean, you know, you, we know how to measure cases now. We know people are taking people's temperatures. You know, I would say if it bounces back, make people wear masks. I mean, you don't wanna lock them down. Maybe, you know, people who wanna travel from an infected area to an uninfected area, take their temperature, you know, don't encourage mass football events involving people from mixed areas. Um, but I, I, I don't understand the lockdown. It seems to me to be, it's almost a, an abuse of civil liberty just because we can. Uh, and, and we the people let them do it to us because we were so panicked. Yeah, Michael, I, I found that actually most unsettling, uh, astonishing that the people rolled over for a lockdown based on no real solid science. And it's just been incredible to watch. And even now, when you explain points like we're discussing and show them Euro Momo and show them the reality is even with lockdown lifting, right, it's heading down in the summer towards next to nothing. And maybe it's going to be 1.5 times 2018, maybe, or 1.7, you know, with the lockdown gone. Maximum, maximum, less than that. Ma 
maximum one, I agree. I'm being two. careful 1. here. 3. I understand, I understand. But you know, <laughs> one point five. Pro yeah, probably no, one point three, I agree, because you can 1. see 1. the Euro, whole of Europe curve and integrate it, look at it's, the area and absolutely. where absolutely. And it's a, it's already it's, it's already hit a bit. Yeah, it's one point three maybe. It's it's plateaued at one point one five. It's going to go up a little bit, but even if you take each of the individual areas in Europe and extrapolate, they've all got no more than 10 or 15% to go. I mean, and remember, Italy has almost nowhere to go. Spain has nowhere to go. You know, I think that, uh, but, you know, one other thing about lockdown is people feel empowered because they're actually doing something to stop the virus. Yeah. And yeah. that's a strange, and this is why they will never admit that it wasn't worth it. Yeah, this is a big problem, but what concerns me is for future freedoms and future decisions, what we've become as a society through this is genuinely concerning to me. And I usually don't worry too much about this stuff because the free market capitalism, it's got a leveling effect on any bad things that might sneak in through the back door. They tend to get thrown back out again. This one is a worry, though. Because what I've seen on unravel over the last couple of months is, is astonishing, like I said. But if we take just Israel, it occurs to me you're in Israel. So Israel's another example I, I'm just thinking of because Israel put in a really hard lockdown when they had relatively few cases. Um, they took apart their lockdown a couple of weeks ago and I was astonished that the Prime Minister even said kids can visit their grandparents again. And we've completely released the uh, 200 meter limit. But he said kids can visit their grandparents. And we're going to hold off for another week before we do the swimming pools and gyms. But most businesses can open. So there in Israel, you've got a case where you've got X amount of cases approximately. You lock down. The curve goes right up in spite of lockdown. Back down again. Gets down to where you started the lockdown. And then you take away the lockdown and kids can visit their grandparents. How, how can the lockdown be taken away when you've still got loads of prevalence in your society? The, surely you've got to the go prevalence, back but, you, but you don't have those big concentrations of untraced cases. And I think that uh, it also may turn out that even a little, you know, people are now finding that perhaps just common colds give you some antibody resistance to this particular coronavirus. Uh, you know, let's just imagine that, uh, you know, you get complete herd immunity at 25%. So far, no one can, you know, it's a number that I like, it's the Diamond Princess number. Um, it's a number which I actually used. At, at one thing I did write about this was to actually say that the excess death, there was a, a paper by a very well-known statistician at Cambridge, Sir, Sir David uh, Spiegelhalter, and he had a paper in the medium in the middle of March saying that the excess burden of death would be one year of excess death. And I looked at that and I said, this is a great paper, but it's actually one month, not one year. And then both he and uh, Neil Ferguson sort of came after me. And I said something which I never liked to say. I said, okay, guys, whatever. I didn't, I felt it wasn't worth arguing my case. My numbers were very, very clear. And now we see that for all of Europe, it's going to be, you know, four weeks. Uh, at, and, and no one can deny that Europe has been very badly hit. It, it may even be three and a half weeks. Um, so basically, you know, they, they, there were a lot of very dubious numbers. Uh, it also turns out that uh, there's, a, there's an, a whole fallacy about R0, because the growth of the virus is R0 times the time you're infected. So if you are infected for three days, you can have a tiny, you can have a, a very big R zero, and if you're infect, infective for three months, you'll kill a lot of people with an R zero of one point one oh oh one. It's just the multiplier of those two things. In fact, the, it's it's R zero minus one times the time infected, and no one knows what the time infected is. No one knows about hidden cases. There was a lot of completely unknown biology in this issue. Uh, I think we're going to see just experimentally when. when Stereotyping is done. We're going to find that uh, you know, in, in, in all of these places, it's going to be around 25%. This is my bet. Uh, again, it goes back to this one experiment of the Diamond Princess, which is obviously too small. Uh, stereotyping is difficult and it's hard to get it right. Um, but this is what's stopping it. Now, it may turn out that in certain locations, for example, in Israel, the climate in Israel now is totally different than it was three months ago. 
two months ago. Even if there was a huge title of virus, I don't believe that the virus is going to spread. It turns out that if you look at, and again, I, I, I use flu not because this is flu, but because we have so much knowledge of flu. So it turns out that flu doesn't like warm climates, but it actually likes warm, humid climates. So flu is endemic in Equatorial Africa. 100,000 kids die of flu every year there, babies, five-year-olds. And this is probably why it's so bad in Brazil. Uh, but if you look at Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, you know, this, this thing, you know, was self-limiting. And uh, one thing that the curves show, and it's a little, a little bit technical, but basically this virus is slowing down from case one. Now, clearly nobody has any lockdown when you have one case. People don't usually implement lockdown until you have, say, a thousand cases or a few hundred cases. Well, it turns out that the, the growth is slowing down. It's never exponential, but it's slowing down very dramatically. So if you infect, you know, three people on day one, then those people will only infect 15% less of those three people and so on. And after, it's a bit like a bank paying you, you know, great thing, come to our bank, we'll pay you 100% for the first week and then 50% for the next week and 25% for the next week. And you'll quickly realize that it would have been way better to have got 3% for the whole year. Um, and, you know, when you have exponential growth decreasing exponentially, it doesn't go very far. And you actually see when you were talking about the shape of the curves, the curves are actually bending from the first moment. I, my, some, of the, some of the things I released in my, my, my podcast show that the curves are really bending from day one. And this is true everywhere. It's true in Iran, and it's true in Italy, and it's true in New York City. Um, and this basically means that there's something slowing down the growth. And what I think that is, I never understood, because it doesn't make sense. If I'm the first case. Surely I can find you know, three other people really easily, and surely they can find th three other people really easily. And we'll get it, you, know, you do that for a short while, and you'll have you know, five days of exponential growth of three people a day. You have a pretty big number. Uh, but I think what is happening is, is that a large fraction, we don't know number, but let's just say for every real case, there are three hidden cases. These are people who are asymptomatic, who feel nothing, but are infected and are infectious. So now I'm, you know, I'm the virus, I'm in case number one, I'm going out looking for people to infect. And I'm feeling great, and I'm the first guy on the block, I'm gonna get somebody. Except unbeknownst to me, all my hidden companions have been out before me, or at the same time. So by the time I get to you know, a fresh case, oops, sorry, somebody just got in. We don't even see that person. So I think if you have these shadow cases, they totally change the dynamic. And there's a lot of evidence now for these shadow cases. Uh, they make the R value a different thing because instead of me infecting everybody, it's all the shadow cases working together. So I think that this explains immediately why you get, essentially the virus is growing slowly, but it's competing with invisible copies of itself. Invisible in the sense that they aren't being counted as confirmed cases. Um, and this is also why when you have case one, you probably have 100 infected people, and this grows. So and, it, it and, makes sense. And that's the essence of the self-limiting, slowing curve and then tapering off. And when you think about it, I mean, in March, there's no question. Uh, in UK, the University of Oxford actually came out with something that was widely rejected. They said, look, already coming into March, we've probably got... 10%, maybe 20% already effectively exposed. And, you know, the University of Manchester now have modeled and they're talking 25%. London rates are falling. But the really stunning thing for me is, uh, probably from Professor Hennigan uh, from Oxford, he clearly shows that the cases peaked and the deaths peaked, indicating mid-March the curve had actually turned so it was actually on the way down before the lockdown really got going and it stayed its shape all the way, blithely ignoring the lockdown. Yeah. Although, Maybe you know, not completely. The, but when the curve goes down, remember you, in, in a country, you don't have a single outbreak that's synchronized. So let's imagine it starts in London and then two days later it starts in Cambridge and then three days later it starts in Manchester. Each of these things are maturing at different rates and you're measuring a single number. And you particularly see this in the 
peak, I mean, a, a single clean epidemic has a peak and then comes down very quickly. If you look at countries like Switzerland or Italy, it's almost like a mountain range. And this is because the different peaks are maturing at different times, but they're all on the way down. I mean, once, once you see the peak, you can essentially say that we're fine. It might be a long peak, but the longest peak is never more than three weeks. I mean, the peak should be a few days, but it can be extended by multiple peaks in different places. Uh, I think that's the problem. But again, I, you know, you, you, you get a pretty clear idea of the extent. I think lockdown, I was very disappointed um, by the lockdown in Britain. So I actually felt that they were going to go uh, the Swedish route initially. And, you know, they changed their mind midstream. And uh, they probably got the worst of both worlds because they got everybody infected in the first part. And then they locked down on all those infected people. And, you know, but they, the hospitals got through it. And the fact remains that I'm sure that Britain is saturated. Yeah. And, you know, so, um, so is most of Europe. And I think that is great because it does mean that, you know, if Slovenia is saturated, Italy is certainly, certainly saturated. Uh, and this is all good news. <laughs> Yeah, and it is. And in fairness to the someone mentioned on Twitter when I said we were having this interview today, I will ask, do you, do you still stand by your thoughts on Sweden? But interestingly, Sweden, I've been watching and they kind of turned, hit their peak in deaths. They are more plateaued in their curve, to your point, and they're going out more flat in deaths rather than falling sharply. Um, so but we need another few weeks to see. But the key thing for me is the ICU loading peaked on the 5th of April and has been falling steadily ever since. So the death rate has to start falling off soon. Otherwise, there's no logic in the world. Well, but, if, but they you, are... uh, if you take Sweden and you say you want it to have, you know, say three quarters out of a thousand dying, so that means 7,500 people, 7,500 deaths in Sweden. They're only halfway there. Uh, I think right now there's maybe 4,000 by today. It was 3,600 yesterday. Mm. So if you, if you just take that logic, I mean, you know, Britain didn't go all the way. 50,000 seems like a huge number, but it's still, you know, the average for all of the euro member countries is 0.7 deaths per thousand. If Sweden does that, it just matches that number. They need to have 7,000 deaths. So they've got a ways to go. So that plateau is, is fine. I mean, I'm not saying they need to get there, but I'm just simply saying that, you know, if, if you may argue, and, 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 you know, there is some level of social distancing. Social distancing is very, very different from lockdown. Uh, you know, not letting people have gatherings of more than 50 people is somewhat of a nuisance, but it's not like you can't leave your house anytime, anyway. My mother has been in, a, in our home in, in London it's a private home with my brother. They haven't moved anywhere since lockdown and they haven't had a single carer come in. She's done fine. Right now she had a problem with her iTunes account. So I fixed that remotely for her. Um, if that's her, if that's the big problem, you can realize that she's not in bad shape. Uh, she was worried about losing her pictures in the cloud. Um, but I, you know, I think that, uh, I, I would agree with you hard lockdown. There is zero evidence that it works. On the other hand, the kind of lockdown or the kind of social distancing, that's being practiced in Japan, for example, or Taiwan, seems to work. And you know, it, it goes again with intuition, particularly people who are technical and mathematical for, for most of their lives. The intuition is pretty good because intuition is not just guesswork. Intuition is based on pattern recognition, uh, neurological processes, skill, experience, talents, all come together to inform intuition. And social distancing from the get-go I intuitively knew that that made sense. It's going to make an impact and protect the hospitals. Where my intuition is screamingly <laughs> very angry and not happy is with the lockdown additional measure, which might add a tiny slice for enormously expensive and damaging uh, intervention. So yeah, and, and you know, Sweden, I exactly, I sent out a survey uh, around six weeks ago and I showed four curves for Sweden and I didn't want it to look ghoulish. But I said A, and I had a total of 18 or 19 or 20,000 deaths. And I showed their curve going on in a big kind of parabola into the summer. And then I had B, C, and D was, it fell off at 6,000 deaths. That's, that's and of course, be right. 
That's the right yeah. one. And, I, I, yeah, and I purposely, right. yeah, I purposely said in the survey, the way people were talking, my A option at 20,000, I said, look, you can also say worse than A. And a lot of people commented worse than A. But I was being a little clever because I kind of was thinking, yeah, well, D, that's what the math says, right? Um, but yeah, only 30% picked D, and they're people who probably follow me, and they'd seen a lot of stuff already. So fascinating. We'll perhaps circle, oh, are there any other key things in this? Because I'm conscious now we've gone over an hour of your time, Michael. That's fine. I, enjoy you know, I, I love talking about this because it clarifies my ideas. Um, I think everything is good. I think, you know, I, I, there's a lot to, I, I kind of wish that, uh, you know, maybe people are doing these things and writing papers on them. I decided that I was going to put myself out there without any, it isn't even going to preprint service. It's just going out there. And there's a lot of analysis that, you know, I like the analysis, less so the words and all the padding. Um, but, you know, you would have thought that people should be looking at things like flu versus corona in the USA, flu versus corona. I would have thought if I was an epidemiologist, I would want to know exactly where flu would hit and then just map, do a correlation between deaths from flu, deaths from corona. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a very good correlation, which would be very important because it means a country that says, we never have flu, open up, you know? Yeah, so on. I so agree. I think, that... But I, you know, I, I think we've discussed everything I could imagine. I, it, it's been great. And uh, you know, this, this is all way beyond what I wanted. But, uh, it, and again, I, I do feel that it's the numbers. I'm just worried about this completely crazy panicked world. Um, if you, uh, I, I send you a link to my Medium post, which is the one thing I actually posted publicly. And the last three words are, can you, do you know somebody who knows somebody who can stop this madness now? And this is the 22nd of March. And, you know, it was a very hard prediction. And I guess I was also saying to my wife, well, you know, maybe I'm just lucky with my predictions. But I basically have been pretty accurate. So even if I'm lucky, you probably should follow me. Um, not because, <laughs> but, you know, it's all based on the numbers. I'm, I'm not somebody who deviates from the numbers well absolutely michael and that's a good way to finish it i mean there is the scientific method with controls proofs and good science uh, there's going by the mathematics and analyzing your data carefully and rapidly to better understand the tempo of a problem uh, and there's all of that science-based stuff and it has been effectively suspended now for two months which kind of i find that offensive because i was always a person I always hated when the technical truth was twisted. You know, some people hate people who lie. I was always really offended if someone twisted the truth around the cause of a quality issue to suit their political purposes. It drove me crazy. And I even managed to never do it myself, which is amazing. It offends me. And this thing has been a living hell for me because of that. But, but we'll get there. And we might circle back in a couple of weeks when these curves really kind of reach their their destination and you can kind of really look back on the whole thing maybe that'd be super michael there's also a silver lining in the way everyone is feeling and that is even a little bit of positivity goes a long long way i mean a lot i'm getting so many emails direct messaging saying just how i brought light into people's lives and you know this is just because they were in such bad places so i think in some ways the fact that some you know some light is getting through the chinks in this very dark time is very important and i think that we are seeing this and i think sweden you know even if they thought it was the wrong thing was a great example because people were are saying yes but there's social distancing look at their travel records looking at this but the fact is is everyone sort of should have social distanced like sweden we would have had no economic damage exactly and cnn team visited there and to be honest i'd say they're being politic and um, how much they're really hard distancing in, in reality, they visited Stockholm and people are in hairdressers. They interviewed people. People were shopping with no real one meter even. So you know what? Sweden are, are pretty soft distancing. Even if many of them are traveling less or working from home, fine. But there's a hell of a lot of activity going on that would be unthinkable uh, to the other countries in Europe. So let, let, let's see what happens. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, it was great to talk to you and I look forward to your tweets and, and whatever. I was... Where do you Super live in, in, in Dublin? Do you live in Dublin? 
I, yeah, I live in Dublin. We've been locked down for about eight weeks and I'm out in my office in the back garden and I, seven days a week, I, <laughs> I'm in the house or the office. I've hardly got out. I think, are things being relaxed? Well, I almost got sick in my plate a week or two ago when they brought out a four month plan to slowly relax the lockdown. I, I and saw to that. read it. Four month. It was, was going to end on 15th of, Mar 15th of August. I saw that. I, I was interviewed yeah. by the Sunday Independent. And they asked me to comment on that plan. And I said, look, I'm not going to tell your government what to do, but they're going to do the right thing because firstly, Ireland has been an economic miracle for the last 30 years compared to where things were. Plus, Ireland is one of the most equal, income equal countries in Europe. It's like Iceland. It has a, a great, it's called the Guinea Index. It's one of the lowest in Europe. And when you have a country like that, they must be doing something right. And the leadership will look at the numbers and do the right thing. Um, that seemed like the best thing I could say politically. We'll see. I'm, I'm optimistic. No one wants to destroy I, an economy. Yeah, and I, I think they'll, they'll wake from their stupor is the way I look at it, but I, I think they will. And the people also, I'm meeting people uh, just out walking the dog, uh, business people who have already worked out what we're talking about. Now there's not too many of them, but there'll be growing numbers looking at the data and saying, okay, hold on a minute. Did I lose my business for this? So hopefully they'll get through to the media too, in time. Thank you so much. It was really nice to talk to you. Bye. Take care. Bye, bye, -bye. now. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen. And go to extratimemovie.com to see our fascinating new documentary on stopping and reversing heart disease.